Welcome everyone. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning. Let's stand and worship together.
pray together. Father God, your, your truth is all that we need, the truth of the gospel. And it can be easy to forget um, that that is all that we need. We chase after all these things that distract us, that promise things and don't deliver. But today, uh, as we sing, as we're reminded of the words in the gospel, I pray that you would fill us, satisfy us with your truth and draw us near, draw us close to you, we pray. It's, it's part, of, part of the joy of worship is to remember how good you are and that you are all that we need. So I, I pray that, that that truth would fill our minds and then eventually spill over into our emotions as we're just overjoyed with how good you are. So be lifted up today, God. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we sing and pray. Amen. Hey, you're going to take a seat, but before you do, I want you to find somebody you don't know and guess their name. Say, you look like a blank, and then take a seat. Welcome, welcome. So glad to have you at South Mountain. Hey, if we haven't met before, my name is Mike. I'm the campus pastor here in Draper, and this is Ren. He's one of our SMCCU teachers. He's teaching Turning Point, which is for people who come from an LDS background. That's starting up again in the fall, right? Hey, we're so glad you're with us, and if we have not received a connection card from you before, we would love for you to fill one of those out. You can find them in the seat back pocket of the chair in front of you, and give us a little bit of information about you. Uh, check any of those circles that apply to you if you want to know more information about anything. And you can leave those in the uh, offering boxes in the back, or you can take them to the new here table out in the lobby where I get to meet the people that are new here. So please come and see me. Yeah, one of the things that you can indicate on that Connect Now card is your interest in joining a community group this coming fall. So the week of September 9th, we kick off our small groups, which are people meeting in homes, being in community together, and growing in their faith, you know, discussing the Bible, sermons from the past week, things like that, just doing life together. Um, we're actually looking for people who are willing to both host uh, the small groups as well as to facilitate the groups. So if... Um, you know, we have a lot of people at SMCC right now who are looking to take their next step in Christian community, and we would love to be able to accommodate as many as we can. So if you are interested in just joining a group or in being trained as a facilitator, please go talk to Curtis and Leslie at the Next Steps counter after church today. Absolutely. Also want to remind you that we are having a backpack drive right now for kids at the international campus that are going back to school and to bless those families, to bless their neighbors with those kinds of things. And so... If you wanna go out and just grab a backpack from somewhere, fill it up with all the items that you would usually uh, t give to a kid to go back to school, there's actually a list on a poster out by the bookstore. You could take a picture of that, fill the backpack up, bring it back and leave it in that wheeled receptacle out there and we'll be sure to, make, uh, to get those out to Pastor Alberto as soon as possible. Well, lastly, next Sunday after second service, uh, op doors will open at 12.30. We've got our next Connect Now lunch. Uh, and this is for people that just have questions and they want to just come. We, we just want to be able to get to know you better, um, share the vision and values of SMCC, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So um, as the name implies, lunch is provided, uh, child care will be available. So if you'd like to register, you can just do that on the app or just go to the upcoming events section of the Draper webpage. Absolutely. Thank you, Ren, for joining me up here. I'm just going to stay put because I'm giving the sermon today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks. Hey, uh, so today we're continuing in our series called Indivisible, and that's the word that means unable to be divided or separated, and that is our preferred future as a community here at South Mountain during this next election season. And really, it's always our desire to be that way. And since we're talking about indivisible from the standpoint of politics, I thought it would be helpful to define our terms and talk a little history. 
So the word politics can be given either a broad or a narrow definition. So broadly speaking, politics denotes the life of the city or the polis. That's where we get the word metropolis. And the responsibility of the citizens towards the city. So politics is concerned with the whole of life in human society and the responsibility of the citizens for the city. Politics is the art of living together in community. But according to a narrow definition, politics is the science of government. It's concerned with the development and adoption of specific policies with a view to enshrining those policies in legislation or laws. You can say politics is about gaining power for social change. At least that's what it's supposed to be about, that kind of power. Unfortunately, we've seen that for some politicians, it's more about putting change in their pockets than changing society. And we're looking for more of the other type. But anyway, we, we have these definitions now so we can ask a question, was Jesus interested in politics? Was he involved in the political realm? Well. In the narrow sense, he clearly was not because he was never involved in a political party. He didn't officially adopt any political programs or organize any political protests. He didn't take any steps to influence the policies of Caesar or Pilate or, or Herod. But in the broad sense of the word, his whole ministry was political. I mean, think about it. He came into the world in order to share in the life of the human community, to teach people how to live rightly with God and with each other and to take care of the sin issue which was causing all the chaos in human society. And then he sent his followers out into the world to teach everyone else how to obey him and flourish as a human. The kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed and inaugurated as its king was a radically new and different social organization with values and standards uh, that were totally game changers and were against the old fallen community. So in this way, his teachings in life were certainly political. It offered a world-shaking alternative to the status quo, and his kingship would ultimately be perceived as a challenge to Caesar's rule, which is why he was accused by some of sedition. Well, what about Christians and the church at large after Jesus? Has it been political? Well, when we look at history, we see that the early Christian community had absolutely no voice in the political process and also did not seem focused on such things anyway, seeing their role more as salting society with kingdom culture, with truth about Jesus, focused on justice and focused on the beauty of the gospel and really preparing people for the ultimate fulfillment of God's kingdom with the earthly return of Christ. However, as Christianity grew and ultimately subverted the Roman Empire, suddenly Christians found themselves in positions of political power for the first time. And we started to have this marriage of church and state, which probably seemed like cause for celebration at the time, but unfortunately had some really negative consequences for hundreds of years. There's a pretty famous saying by a man known as Lord Acton from the 1800s. You may have heard it before. He said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts Absolutely, and unfortunately, that was the situation when the church and state came together. Eventually, after many wars, lots of corruption, lots of bad behavior, people realized that the church and state combo leads to authoritarian rule and a lack of human freedom, especially when Jesus is removed from the church equation. Yet the moral framework for a thriving culture based on the rule of law comes from Scripture, the Old and the New Testament. So the church still has much to say about how obeying Jesus leads to flourishing when it comes to governance, and Christians should be in the middle of the political sphere. Great example of that would be William Wilberforce, who, of course, was part of the abolition of slavery in England and uh, started the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and a lot of other amazing organizations. And he thought about maybe getting out of politics at one point and approached John Newton, the man who wrote Amazing Grace. And John said, don't you dare get out of politics. We need you there because you're making a huge impact on the culture. So today, we have many believers that are involved in the political realm and plenty of Christians with opinions on all sorts of political matters across the spectrum of the right and left side of politics. But that wasn't always the case. Last week, we kicked off this series 
with a few important points. The tagline for this series is the best vision for yet another election season. Now, what do we mean by the best vision? Well, a vision is a preferred future of what could be and what should be. A future for you and I that still has peace, security, and love throughout the year. A future for us that's full of unity because we've made a pre-decision that unity is actually the win. Last week we said this, at SMCC, nothing upcoming should be cause for dividing. For the body of Christ, no political scenario is worth dividing over. Now let me pause for a second and just say that doesn't mean that we do not debate about candidates or issues vigorously, and sometimes we have to agree to disagree amongst each other. It just means that at the end of the day, we are united as the body of Christ, putting political issues aside. Kind of like this text chat that I'm in with a bunch of guys that I played on a worship team with 30, almost 30 years ago. We get in there, and when we're not talking about worship songs, we're usually talking about politics. And we banter back and forth uh, about various issues and various candidates, one in particular. But at the end of the day, we're all brothers and sisters, uh, brothers in Christ, and these differences are all secondary to our affinity with one another in the body. And you know, everybody in this room probably have friends who are of a different political persuasion than you are, and you'll find folks who love Jesus over there, you know, on the other side of the aisle. So I'm not saying that we act like particular issues aren't important for the sake of unity. Some issues uh, have significant moral implications, and we should take issue uh, with the opposing point of view. But we do say that Jesus followers think very carefully over whether something is worth dividing over. Because sometimes, you know, it has way more to do with preferences or a media narrative that is seeking to pit us against each other than something truly worth losing a relationship over. So nothing should be cause for dividing as the body of Christ. That was one of the points we made last week. Second, we said last week that a pastor's job is to present people fully mature in the Lord. And this is different from peddling fear, dropping hot takes in sermons, and disguising political rallies as worship services. And unfortunately, that is happening all over America these days. We took a look last week at the throne of God in heaven, a picture from the Bible of Jesus ruling and reigning up there in Revelation 4. And we'll look again at that in a little bit. That vision can lead us through this time united together. So if last week was a vertical vision towards uh, looking at God in our unity, looking at this, this week is a horizontal one, how we approach one another. And you might remember last week, this key verse is the challenging truth that we wanna wrap our, our heads around today. It's 1 Corinthians 1.10, where the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. In other words, the win for this election season is not about who wins an election, it's that we would be indivisible. Us, SMCC, you and me, our leaders, pastors, brothers and sisters, that's, that's the win. So I wanna explore what was happening in the Corinthian church that made Paul write to them in the first place, and then I also wanna look at a couple of really unlikely candidates, if you will, who are part of the 12 apostles and uh, they walked with Jesus together, and they, they, were, they were kind of the kind of folks you wouldn't put in the same room usually. They illustrate what we are shooting for today. So let's look at Corinth. Corinth, Paul had gone in there and started this church, and some, some crazy stuff was happening. Um, people weren't being indivisible at all, and so he's kind of rebuking them for what he, this, this report that he gets. And he talks about it in verses 11 and 12 of chapter one. He says, my brothers and, and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, well, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. And another says, I follow Christ. <laughs> so he's kind of trying to outdo everybody, I guess. And Paul had heard about this division from the church he didn't get emails like we do today, but somebody from Chloe's people had gotten a message to him and said people were splitting into these four different factions. Some people were fans of Paul, some of Apollos, some of Cephas, which is just another way of saying Peter, and others of Jesus. And you know, in this room, 
There are different party lines than in Corinth as we talk about 21st century politics instead of first century Christian leader fan clubs, but party lines nonetheless. And each party has its reason for choosing a political leader, and the opposing party has their reasons for strongly rejecting that political leader and putting forward their own. Well, unforeseen divisions and disunity over politics is found, unfortunately, in, in many churches today. Despite the fact that we've been called to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, as Paul says, Christians find it hard sometimes to get along with one another. This is one of the many problems that they were facing in the first century church in Corinth. The Apostle Paul, like I said, had helped to plant this church in the city. He'd ministered to these people for over a year and a half. And now things were getting divisive. And so he alludes to these four distinct groups in which the membership at Corinth had divided into. So without being too dogmatic about what exactly was going on there and what they were following after, let's just analyze the situation for a minute, see what we can take out of it. First, the rivalries do not seem to be doctrinal in nature. It doesn't seem like there were sort of aberrant beliefs or they were denying something in the gospel or anything like that. It seems more like they were being divided by something else. It could have been social stratification uh, or class um, or the leaders who had baptized them. Maybe that was how they were, you know, falling under people. Or an allegiance, an allegiance to their respective house churches uh, or some other preference. We really don't know. But what's noteworthy is the self-centeredness that prevails in each of these declarations. Each begins with the pronoun I. So it was this me focus that highlighted the lack of unity they were having. And as a result, they were inadvertently dividing what was intended to never be divided. We could sum it up with this statement, a divisive lie. And if you're filling in your blanks, it would be the word divisive there. My party and my people are most accurate and most superior when it comes to my priority issues. That's the divisive lie. And it was leading to division with them. My party, for instance, Peter's group. My people, Peter's people who think like me are most superior, we are better than everybody else because we follow Peter, because we have prioritized the right issues, like whatever those might be. So just take that divisive lie and throw it into our political tensions today, it's the exact same formula. But if we reverse engineer this lie, we actually arrive at the truth. So if we say for the Jesus follower, there's a primary community to participate in, his community, with his people valuing all people, and he prioritizes the issues before we do. So what is Paul's response to this division he's been informed about? What's his approach to uniting a group of divided people? Well, he asks three rhetorical questions, each of which demands a negative reply. Let's take a look at what those were. He said in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? He's mocking these people for saying that they're with him. Let's look at these questions a little bit more. Is Christ divided? Well, obviously the answer is no. It's impossible to divide the indivisible. There's only one undivided Christ. And if you know him and belong to him, that's your primary leader. We don't get too high or too low about the leader of our country because we follow the perfect leader of the entire universe. And I'm not saying don't care or it doesn't matter who's elected, it does, but it could only affect us and should only affect us in the amount that reflects our understanding of the priorities of the king. Christ is not divided, but the Corinthian church was behaving as if he was. And when the horizontal relationships within the church are out of kilter, it's a clear sign also that the vertical is disconnected. What can happen in churches is a, is a tendency to only relate in an accepting way towards others when the church culture, their church culture fits with our church culture. Whether we're talking about spiritual matters or political matters. Like we only are nice to people when they agree with us. And as with those who are members of the church in Corinth, we need to remember that it's not our personal preferences and perspectives that hold us together, but rather our common identity in Christ. So then the next question that he posits is, was Paul crucified for you? And you really could put any blank in there. Was so-and-so crucified for you? And of course the answer is no. 
It's impossible for one sinful human to bear the sins of others when they're already weighed down with their own sins. There's no way for one sinful human to take the place of another sinner when we all stand equally guilty before God. So, you know, in the political realm, think about your favorite politician and the one who gets your vote this fall. Was that person crucified for you? No. Therefore, we give our lives to the one who was and do what he says to do, which is to not divide over something else. And then Paul says, were you baptized into that tribe or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Again, a negative response is required. There's only one that people are baptized in or into whose name any of us can rightly be baptized in, and that's Jesus. And by the way, we are gonna have another baptism here. We just had that great celebration out on the lawn with a whole bunch of people baptized across the campuses. We're gonna have one up here on August 18th during worship, and so if, if baptism is on your mind, if you've been thinking you wanted to do that or you missed out on the opportunity in June, please fill out, put that on a connection card that you wanna get baptized, and we'll talk about it soon. So you might be a part of a political party, but you haven't been united to them through a symbolic picture of life and death, right? Becoming a Jesus follower, that's what baptism is all about. Baptism signifies identification and relationship with the one whose name we are baptized into. So these three questions from Paul, I believe were the Holy Spirit's way of shaking these people free from the lies that were dividing them in order to make them indivisible again. We don't see him bring this up in 2 Corinthians, so maybe this tactic worked and they got more united. We also see a picture of this in Jesus' ministry, like I mentioned, with two people who may have started out as enemies politically based on what we know of them, but they ultimately ended up working together to spread the gospel. So let me read the list of people who walked with Jesus, the 12, and show you how startling a couple of people in, the li in this list really are. It's kind of like if we had Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich in the same posse. So Matthew chapter 10, two through four, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, there's Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and then Mas Matthew, the tax collector. Interesting that he gets that title along with his name. And it's Matthew who's writing it. <laughs> He's outing himself. James, son of Alphaeus, and then Thaddeus, and then Simon the Zealot. Simon gets a title. Interesting. And then Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Simon the Zealot, one of the most obscure apostles. We know almost nothing about him, but the title really is telling. He most likely belonged to a Jewish sect known as the Zealots, who were bent on revolution and looking for a Messiah, a Christ who would overthrow Rome. The Zealots were associated with violent uprisings, including later the first Jewish-Roman war, which destroyed Jerusalem. And they expected the coming Christ to overthrow Rome using force. Um, we might even accuse them of actually doing terrorist activities uh, as, one of, as some of their tactics. Our most detailed description of who they were um, and how the movement started comes from a guy named Flavius Josephus, a Jewish Roman historian who lived during the first century. Here's how Josephus explains them in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. He says, yet was there one Judas, a Golanite, of a city whose name was Gamala, who, taking with him Sadduk, a Pharisee, became zealous to draw them to revolt, who both said that this taxation was no better than an introduction to slavery. So it was, it was like an anti-tax movement from the Romans, and exhorted the nation to assert their liberty. These men agree in all things with the Pharisaic notions, but they have an inviolable attachment to liberty and say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. And it was in Gesius Florus's time that the nation began to grow mad with this distemper. This Gesius was their procurator and who occasioned the Jews to go wild with it by the abuse of his authority and to make them revolt from the Romans. It's interesting. Their attitude echoes that of the American Revolution, really. Um, Don't tread on me was kind of the zealot's mindset. This group wanted to incite rebellion out of a sense of liberty and patriotism. 
Well, juxtapose that mentality with Matthew, the Jewish tax collector. He had essentially betrayed his kinsmen by working for Rome and making a living off of the burdensome taxation of his own people. If you've watched The Chosen, they uh, postulate, you, know, you can kind of tell by Matthew's disposition that he's on the spectrum. Because for somebody to be a tax collector <laughs> like that would have to not care what people think of them. And so maybe, we don't know whether he was on the spectrum or not, but you can tell there's a lot of um, hatred and bad attitude going towards Matthew, even amongst the apostles at first, in that show. So essentially, we end up with these two guys from the right and the left side of the political spectrum sharing a table with Jesus. And while we don't know much about Simon, there's good evidence to conclude that, like I said, Matthew went on to pen the gospel that bears his name. And he includes Simon with that moniker, the zealot, as do the other three places where he's mentioned in, in Mark, Luke, and Acts. So we see in these two that they set, eventually, they set their political ideas aside because Christ wasn't divided. And both Simon and Matthew found their identity in Jesus. They were totally unlikely allies. So that begs the question, what about us in the church? Can we be unlikely allies united under one banner, the banner of King Jesus? He's not divided. He's the one who many of us have been baptized into, and he's the one who was crucified for our sins. So first and foremost, may we be pro-Jesus. And in order to live out the instructions of 1 Corinthians 1 and to be indivisible this year, I thought it would be good to just invite us all to consider five commitments that we could make. The first one would be this. I will bow before the throne of God and not any office on earth. And of course, if we hearken back to Revelation 4, let me read just a little bit of that vision where the creatures, the, the creatures around the throne are, are singing and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. So as I think about that, I think my allegiance is to King Jesus before any and all political figures, parties, and platforms. Which actually, from my own personal study, might mean that I don't actually align totally with any political party. I value things like the intentional care for the marginalized, care for the immigrant, care for the refugee. I also value small, limited government. I also value personal autonomy within a culture guided by the rule of law. So it's kind of a little bit of this party and a little bit of that party, but ultimately I align wholly with Jesus. Another commitment to consider, I will put people before parties. And that kind of harkens back to uh, 1 Corinthians 10, where he asks that there be no division among us, but that we be perfectly united in mind and thought. I, I want to make a commitment that I won't be dismissive and rude to people in the body of Christ who I disagree with politically or in any other way on a secondary issue. The second great commandment, to love my neighbor as myself, demands that I act that way. It's actually what one of our cultural values is based on, that value that says we measure maturity at South Mountain by how much we love each other. Bible knowledge will never be more important than love. And then the next two commitments are bundled in one sentence. I will listen before I speak, and I will consider nuance. James 1.19 says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If you listen to the person you disagree with and ask good questions, you'll be amazed at how that alone can lower the temperature in a political conversation. When everybody digs in their heels on an issue or a candidate and doesn't take the time to understand where the other person is coming from, nothing changes. A lot of times there are much deeper issues at play and the person you're talking to doesn't have the same assumptions that you do. So speaking as though they do is pointless. 
And the other part of this commitment that I think may be the biggest in the whole discussion is the word nuance. That word is missing from political discussions today. People paint with a broom on everything. Do you see what I just did there? Even I just did it. People paint with a broom. I used to do a podcast with uh, the former campus pastor here, Rick Henderson. It was called Sacred Skeptics. We had a lot of fun doing that. And one of the things we love to do is get into the nuance of all these hot potato issues that would come about in the media. And it would drive some people crazy. We would get hate mail because we refused to just restate the prevailing narrative from the right or from the left when we knew there was much more to those issues. And then finally, a commitment we can make is to identify who the real enemy is. And the Apostle Paul talks about this in a number of different places, but in Ephesians 6, 12, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, maybe you're not used to thinking about the evil that exists around us in the metaphysical realm. It's easy to forget about it in our rationalistic culture. We're all you know, great, great, great grandchildren of the Enlightenment, and so we're, we're really into the tactile, the things that we could see and experience. And so sometimes we forget that there are things like that going on. Conversely, some Christians actually do the opposite, and they accidentally treat the devil like he's omnipresent and messing with them personally all the time. Well, the supernatural worldview of the Bible tells us that Satan is real, but he's not able to be everywhere at once. He has a network of demonic beings that do his bidding across the globe, and they are super good at derailing humans by attacking us at our weakest points through our cultural beliefs, in our relationships, and in our vices. In our cultural beliefs, in our relationships, and in our vices. I'd say there's a good chance in the political realm whenever you find these confrontations, there are spiritual forces that have embedded lies in the culture that have ensnared the minds of people that have been driven to conclusions that are unbiblical. And I, I've seen evidence of this for years because I've worked in developing countries and you see the lies that come a lot of times from religious systems that keep people in bondage and keep them in poverty. They don't understand what it means to be an image bearer, to be created in the image of God, the capacity they have as human beings. They end up thinking because of these lies that are coming from religious systems that God is capricious, that he has to be bribed to be good to them. And they end up thinking fatalistically, like life is never gonna get any better for them because it wasn't, it wasn't good for their parents or their grandparents and they're gonna be subjected to the same thing. They can't see that there are positive ways that the future could unfold before them. So your enemy in a political discussion involving a moral issue is not the person you're talking to. Your enemy is the metaphysical thing that encouraged the false belief in the first place, and evil that could actually be manipulating the disagreement in the moment. And if you wanna read more on these kinds of topics, pick up a copy of The Unseen Realm, The Spiritual Worldview of the Bible by Michael Heiser. And also, uh, Pastor Eric is actually working on a ser sermon series right now on spiritual warfare that he's gonna unpack in the fall. I'm really looking forward to what he's gonna delve into there. He was telling me that once he started doing research on spiritual warfare, he had a number of unusual things happen to him. So anyway, we'll hear more about that, I'm sure. So to review, the divisive lie is my party, my people are more superior with my issues. Let's reverse that and think this way. With my issues, nuance says that I may not be considering all the angles on every topic, and my number one issue might not be another's. They may vote one way based on their number one issue, and I vote another way. Most issues are more complex than a soundbite. Even if I think another person is wrong, that doesn't make them less valuable to God. I can't see myself as superior in a conversation. Perhaps by listening, I can understand them. And by doing that, I'm putting a real person before an impersonal party megaphone. I will always remember that the real enemy is not political but spiritual, and that changes, that changes how I fight and that changes what the win is. 
Jesus ultimately wins, and I bow before him. My tribe is the Jesus tribe. That's my real party. He's my God, and his people are my people. Like it says in Philippians chapter 2, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. You know, disunity will always disrupt the mission of the church. Our mission is to advance the kingdom of Jesus, to be a part of bringing transformation to our culture. Our mission is to represent him in our world so that he can bring healing and hope and restoration and unity. So our bottom line today is we should make every effort to be what might be unlikely but undivided allies in the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you as as broken people who are easily distracted from your priorities. And when it comes to the political realm, we ask that you give us wisdom and discernment by your spirit and guide us into being unified as your people and for your causes, even when we don't agree with each other on different political issues. May we represent you rightly in a world that doesn't understand how much they need you more than the candidate of their choice. May we be known for our love and not our campaign slogans. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please stand and sing with us.
guys are dismissed. On your way out, if you're interested in joining a group or hosting a group, please talk to the Waylands at the info booth. We need more of those people. So you guys are dismissed. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.